Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in San Francisco. This is Silicon Angles, the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. Join my co-host Jeff Frick, general manager of our Cube operations. Filling in for Dave Olat, he's out on the road. Uh, Dave's watching on his mobile app. I just talked to him on the phone. Dave, a shout out to you. Uh, get on crowd chat, tweets and stuff. We'll be watching. Uh, my next guest is Jason Snow, CEO of Cycle Computing, Cube alumni. Um, became famous literally overnight, internet famous on the Cube, uh, our Amazon a reInvent uh, conference. Our first time we've got the Cube to one of the big Amazon shows, and now we're never going to leave. We're like a tick. We're embedded into the into the into the system. We're not leaving. Uh, Jason, welcome back. Thanks a lot for having me, John. It's um, great to be here. Your last interview was one really was awesome. Like, it was still, it's one of my, one of my favorite interviews. Very memorable. A lot of passion, a lot of energy, um, and it was really our first exposure to Amazon at doing a live show at the Amazon event. We've been customers of Amazon, so you know, we're drinking the Kool-Aid, using it, happy customer. But the question was, is it the real deal? It was always what everyone's asking, um, and your interview was really awesome. So you're doing some real stuff right now on Amazon. Let's recap what's going on sure. and what's happening here at the show. Yeah, so we've definitely had um, a real uptick in usage since the, the 156,000 core run that we did in November. Uh, but we've also had a lot of great case studies where real customers have kind of come forward and talked about various aspects of life sciences or manufacturing or um, insurance and financial services have been doing work. So we had you know Johnson & Johnson talking about uh, different storage and archival models uh, at a conference recently. The Aerospace Corporation, now these guys do some really cool rocket design for the Apollo missions back in the 60s, but most recently they, they did the rocket that brought Curiosity to Mars. Now their future generations of rockets will in part be designed and simulated on AWS and Cycle software, uh, basically doing all of the engineering aspect of kind of uh, literal rocket science. Okay. So there's uh, a bunch of different use cases in, in large companies and in government, but yeah. I mean, I'd, no, I'd love to. Normally we get guys on here like, hey, I'm the CEO of a company, I built an app on uh, a CrowdChat app on Amazon like <laughs> us and blah, blah, blah. You're doing some pretty serious scientific computing, really kind of little high-powered stuff. Um, so that must get a lot of attention. So like, there's a lot of guys going out there doing Internet of Things. You're hearing about, uh, Jeff and I were on, a, on, a, on a, an event with the GE, mm -hmm. and turbines, oil exploration, hospitals, yep. big use cases where computing and having huge resource available is out there. So, so that being said, that's pretty much a done deal. We see the Internet of Things coming. Yep. How are you seeing that? trend. I mean, it's obviously early on now, but what are some of the things people are doing on the high performance side? Crunching numbers? Is it exploration? Yeah, science everything, research? What do you see? Yeah. There's, a, there's a, a large amount of use cases across life sciences. So it's everything from genome analysis to proteomics like and drug design, all the way through designing your clinical trials so that you take fewer samples from your patients, right? And when you have like uh, pediatric cancer kind of clinical trials, you want to be drawing blood from them as little as possible. So these kinds of use cases are definitely common. AWS has been a really enabling platform from an infrastructure perspective, but we have a, a large number of uh, Fortune 500s as well that are kind of doing uh, just your regular product design work. So uh, Steve Philpott, the CIO of uh, HGST, which is a Western digital company, they make most of the, the hard drives that are in your laptops and your computers and, and even in S3. Um, that company is now designing its next gen hard disks on their own hard disks inside of AWS. So it's a kind of a Skynet-y thing, but yeah. Steve's a very the forward The compiler for the compiler. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I don't get that. Hard it, drive for the hard drive. It's recursive technical computing, but in the meantime, they- well, Virtualization they just, has caused some interesting things, right? You can just do some virtualization, yeah. you got now the cloud. Um, this brings up the thinking different mindset, you know, the classic Apple commercial, think differently. What have you seen out there that's different, that's vectoring into mainstream, that's going to be disruptive? What's, what's that foreign object that people are, haven't figured out yet that's coming into the market that's going to be yep. the new disruptor? So I think, I think the exciting thing about cloud, and I've said this before, maybe even on this show, is that you can now do things that you couldn't do before. Like when you got a car, you could travel more than 50 miles in a day without killing a horse, right? So nowadays we can spin up a compute environment that's massive, if only for a few hours, to make it so that large Fortune 500s, Fortune 100s can do amazing work. We've got um, people that used to only have a couple of thousand cores or a few hundred cores in house, can now dip in, grab 8,000 cores, run several weeks worth of work in a day or two, 
and be able to return back a result. That's huge for risk management. It's huge for product design. Anyone that's designing a physical product is doing computational fluid dynamics. They're doing heat transfer simulation. All of these kind of core heavy engineering applications can now be done much, much faster on a utility basis in the cloud than they could ever have been done before. Right, right. Um, so the last few things we talked with you guys about was actually around 156,000 core environment that was essentially would have cost $68 million if you bought it. But instead, we used it for 18 hours and paid 33,000 bucks. You're right. Uh, and this was for a material science use case. Since then, we've actually had companies that are doing paint or other forms of materials design actually come out and say, look, we need to do this exact same thing to generate next generate materials for manufacturing. Right. So this is a really exciting time because the use cases are kind of exploding. It used to be you know, genomics and maybe some forms of financial services, but now we're seeing things in manufacturing and energy and all kinds of different parts of the, the kind of the scientific and engineering computing spectrum. Uh, it's been very exciting. Well, it's, it was great because Andy and his keynote talked about kind of a, I don't know if it's a re, re going back to, but the supporting of an experimental kind of way of doing things. And then you, you're doing that on like super steroids, yeah, experimenting in ways that they could never even imagine was possible. I mean, are people kind of catching up to it? Do they, do they sit there and their eyes roll in the back of their head as it slowly starts to sink in to really think about things that they couldn't do, yep. that they would never even think of potentially doing, now that suddenly you've been able, by bringing all this power to bear for you know limited periods of time, to, to accomplish specific tasks. Yeah, so, we, so our, our user base has a majority of people running 40 to 4,000 cores on a day-to-day -day basis, day in, day out, on a regular basis. But every time we do these larger scales, and it started, uh, we did a 10,000 core cluster in 2011 with Genentech. Um, and then from there did a 30,000 and a 50,000 core. Last year we did a 10,000 server in that really large 150,000 core environment. Every time we do those, we get customers that are now like, hey, you know, I'll give you an example. In our pipe right now, we have a pilot with a very large financial services institution. They're probably going to need 20 to 25,000 cores to take a 20-day process and turn it into a one-day process. Um, so when we do that kind of really large run, people come out of the woodwork and it's like, oh, well, 25,000 cores is no big deal. It's not 150,000, right? I mean, it's, it seems reasonable now, even though if you were to think about it on a practical level, right. 25,000 cores a year ago was just astronomically large. Right. But yet Amazon has the capacity that Cycle can go in and build the live uh, computing environment for you know, essentially a Fortune 100 company that needs to be able to run a real business process and get the results back as quick as possible. So how much of your business is just building and putting the infrastructure in play versus getting people to start to think in terms of those scale, in that type of scale? Yeah, so I, we do the large use cases to help them with that, but I think a majority of what we've been helping with uh, over the last year or two has been helping get ISV's applications so that you can push a button and have a computational fluid dynamics environment or a heat transfer environment or a genomics analysis environment and you just use our software you fill out a small web form and you have a compute cluster that does what the bare metal that you have in house did but it doesn't take you weeks to months to get it it doesn't sit there for three years and depreciate right you know it right. has a much better cost profile and right. agility profile um, getting those applications and making it so that isvs can very easily get onto cloud is actually critically important for the users because you know people don't want 156,000 core clusters. Right. They want the solar material that's going to make a better panel right. and give them a competitive advantage. That's what they care about. So this is basically what we've been really focused on quite a lot. Jason, I want to ask you some um, some questions about the market. Obviously, um, given your perspective, you're under the hood. You're doing some amazing things. Huge cores you're spinning up, but now you have three categories: the old guys being disrupted. Yep. The new guys, been around for like less than less than ten years, maybe five years. The the new disrupt, the new disruptors being disrupted, and then the new entrants. So you're seeing kind of like three phases of actors out there: the old guys, the IBMs of the world, the HPs, Oracles. The new guys, maybe a startup that got funded five years ago, maybe built a, a cloud of a certain direction. That's an unwind pivot or whatever, but big funding. And then the new guys. Yep. What's the disruption? Those are, those are the guys being disrupted on the far end. The right. new guys disrupt completely. And then this guy here is trying to figure out whether he's disrupting or being disrupted. Right. So, so either way, there's a lot of shifting going on. You have IBM, Google, HP, Oracle, EMC, Pivotal, VMware, Microsoft, all coming out with the cloud. Cisco announcing a billion dollar cloud. I mean, come on. Yep. 
So I think... I mean, I, you start to go, okay, we're in a cloud war. Yep. But the reality is it comes back down to what the reality in the marketplace is. Yep. What customers want, what are the technical solutions. So describe, who's being disrupted? Who's the disruptors? And what are the key things for success in the future? In the future's cloud for ubiquitous compute, ubiquitous storage, application deployment, Internet of Things. What are those key levers? What are the pressure points? Yeah, so from a motivation perspective, talking about that first, right? Uh, and then the, the party second. So in terms of motivators, the big one is access, right? So people that couldn't get something before, whether it's a big data environment or an HPC environment, but, but more specifically, it's a utility access to a computational application. That is now very quick. It used to be that your vendor had to say, oh, well, I know a bunch of guys over at HP, they can ship you a few servers, we'll install the software on it, you can evaluate this for a while, and then maybe buy it. Now I can push a button and get a cluster that runs it in 15 minutes. Yeah, and so not hiring, huge... not interviewing people either. Right, exactly. <laughs> so you don't have the administration coefficient. A lot of the internal guys that used to do the administration can now actually help users use computational science to better the business or to use data analytics to better the business. So it's a much better focus of effort and focus on core competency. Mm -hmm. So the, the utility access is a big one, the focus is a big one, and then obviously the pay-as-you-go aspect is, is huge. So having, you know, amortizing the risk of utilization, that, that was the problem. When you used to buy a lot of infrastructure for computation, you'd have to do peak versus median usage analysis and figure out, all right, well, we can afford to spend this much, but then you're jailed by that capacity because that's the biggest question you can ask going forward. Now that's not the case. That's foundational. You set a foundation, you're kind of stuck with the footprint. Exactly. Uh, for three years or five, depending on how long your depreciation schedule is. Yeah, versus an elastic, no pun intended, or pun intended, more of an elastic model. So basically where Cycle comes in and what we've been really focused on is basically helping the ISVs to disrupt user access patterns without having to necessarily change the license model. So if I'm, you know, Western Digital as an example, the HGST, the, the subsidiary that, that talked to reInvent, Stephen uh, Philpott's doing a great job of, of transforming that business, making the engineering more agile, making it more reactive to, to the market conditions. And that process is one of benefiting from elastic capacity, but it's also a person transition. So the other thing that's going on is kind of what you asked about, are we, are we doing a majority of our time evangelizing? I think the market kind of comes around and that's why those really large use cases are critical because it shows what the potential is. And then someone says, oh, well, you know, I never would have asked for 25,000 cores before, but now I'm going to do a pilot with one because I know it'll change my business. And that's a, that's a big, big difference. So those are the kinds of disruptions that are happening. From uh, who it's going to disrupt, I think it's going to disrupt everyone. If you ignore elastic capacity, utility access to applications, you're not going to be in business forever. It's just the bottom line of it from a, a practical standpoint, whether you're uh, a Dell or an HP or an IBM, or you're you know, on the startup front, you should be thinking about what's best for the user. And this is one of the things I know you and I talked about before being a bootstrap. Yeah. You're myopically focused on the customer in much the same way Amazon is. So we basically have a, a key initiatives around making sure we're hitting customer use cases only. We don't build science projects, we build stuff that does real work for a user. And um, I think that applies to all three of those categories. So the traditional players, get myopically focused on the user and what they want. How do they want to pay for it? How do they want to be able to use it? What's the usage pattern? For the newer entrants, you probably have other innovations that you bring into the table, but at least bring it to the table in the right way around access as well. Um, it's an absolutely critical function. And that's Expose one of the things... that service to people. Exactly. And this is where we've been helping the application vendors a lot. I think there's been a so lot of... So let about developers. So obviously the big guys will focus on whatever they want to do. Um, their strategies, Cisco, IBM, HP, but they all got big accounts, they have big install base, they have customers to listen to. The good news about IBM and these guys is they got big customers. Yep. Um, the question I have for you is around developers. There seems to be a land grab for developers right now. Everyone wants to win the developer community. Yep. Every company I talk to, HP, IBM, oh, we have a developer ecosystem. Well, do you? Yep. <laughs> Maybe you had one. Maybe it's a little bit old. You know, Microsoft, some say Microsoft's developer community is really hasn't been upgraded and modernized, and some debate that. But the point is, the guy who's developing value, right. they're going to get inundated with spam. Yep. Work on my platform. So, so, okay, what's your advice to folks who have that strategy? How does IBM, how does Google, how do they win the developers over? How do they, and, and in, a, in a way that's not in their face. 
Right. Yeah, I think you know, I think the key thing is to make all of the APIs open and available and have really great partner programs where you're essentially subsidizing usage of your platform for those users so that they're able to develop for you. I know we've spent a, a significant amount of effort in supporting AWS, and I know the AWS guys have done a great job of partnering with us around making it so we can grab you know, a $68 million environment for 1500 bucks an hour. Um, you know, that kind of uh, outreach is definitely an important aspect of things. On, from a cycle perspective, I can give you a first-hand account on this, though, is where, where we interact with the applications is a lot of the, the engineering and scientific apps aren't built for cloud. They, they, the code base is not really oriented around that. It's oriented around infrastructure. So one of the things that we've been doing a lot of is basically making it so you don't have to modify your code. It basically, we make cloud infrastructure look like the HPC clusters that these applications run in already. That way, no developer effort is really required to make it run inside of the cloud environment. So the other point I would make is that to the extent that AWS and, and, and all of the other parties you're mentioning can make it very easy to not really have to do any coding necessarily to your API to have your application deployable, that's a huge benefit, absolutely huge benefit. Let's talk about the game-changing nature of HPC, high-performance computing. Boy, sure. that world's changed, right? Box-centric. Yep. Data center centric clusters. You mentioned HPC clusters. How is HPC changing, and how does big data affect that? And and is there is it going to be two camps, old and new? Interesting. Are they blending together? I mean, you're doing things pretty creatively. You're looking at spot pricing and all cluster analysis. You can spin up stuff pretty quickly. Um, how is that market changing? How is HPC changing? That's a great question. Um, so so there's two things about that. First off is. There are, there are multiple different workloads that are actually called, they're, they're, they're called commonly HPC, but that they aren't all necessarily HPC. So there's a lot of folks that are running you know, massively parallel weather work that is true HPC, it's very interconnect sensitive, et cetera. There's, there's those class of workloads. There's also the things that are more high throughput oriented and they're essentially geared at uh, enabling people to find needles in haystacks or run Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, do business analytics, do genomics. Um, those are the high throughput uh, oriented workloads. And then there's the big data stuff where you have a really tight coupling with the data and the, the, the compute side of it. Those three workloads really have different properties. And what we're seeing is A, the low end or, or the everyday use cases, the engineering your physical product side of, of traditional HPC, the cost performance is now uh, and not having the overhead of managing the infrastructure is now beneficial enough that manufacturing workloads, which normally would only be done in-house, are now moving kind of cloud. On the opposite end of the spectrum, data, uh, the big data side, there's a lot of usage of big data in cloud from the beginning. They kind of almost grew up together. Um, you know, they're, they're brother and sister rather than first cousins. Yeah. So uh, in the middle, the high throughput side, you can get tremendous time compression. And this is that 264 years of work in 18 hours uh, compression that we got in November, right? Where we, we did a quarter of a compute millennium of material science in less than a day because we grabbed a very large amount of infrastructure. And that one isn't as closely related as the big data side, but it is uh, uh, a, a ripe use case. So what I, my prediction, I guess, would be big data will continue to work in cloud-friendly manner because traditional HPC clusters shouldn't be doing big data problems. Um, so using them in the cloud makes sense. High throughput workloads, pretty universally should be looked at in a cloud context. And the MPI workloads, there'll always be a section where Uber performance is important, but the everyday use cases will start coming to cloud as price performance kind of makes sense. And, and as um, you know, Amazon keeps dropping prices, it's going to keep enabling more and more classes of science that didn't make sense to make sense uh, on cloud. So I, I think it's an exciting time, obviously, if you're a, an engineer, a quant, a life science researcher, all of those guys are going to tremendously benefit how about the from people, these how about changes. The, how about the people supplying HPC solutions? You got a lot of vendors who have old models out there. Um, yeah. How are they going to adjust? You got Intel makes components. You got the box yep. guys making gear. Um, so Intel, I think, is doing a great job. They're they're um, actually enabling through having Ivy Bridge available on on AWS, like right out of the chute. Through having uh, Sandy Bridge was actually available on AWS before it was available anywhere else. Um, so that kind of uh, Close partnership definitely benefits the end user, but it also makes um, those processor types much more relevant to end users, allows them to get better compute per dollar 
than they normally would get. So you see Intel as a player in this? Oh, they're doing a great job, yeah. I, I definitely think there's going to be a lot of stuff we'll see out of Intel that'll be very interesting. I, I also think, you know, on the traditional box vendor, the people selling, you know, IBM selling its server business is um, not coincidental. So it'll be interesting to see how that market evolves. But the fact that, you know, you have one of the folks kind of getting out of that space is somewhat of an indicator where it'll, well, where HP, it'll land HP, is... HP, IBM, you're seeing Oracle getting into the engineering systems. Yeah. Kind of purpose-built, high-end, yep. high-performance. Yep. <laughs> God yep. boxes. I guess they used to call them God boxes. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's right. It's big iron. So, Jason, you, you've mastered the art of spinning up lots of compute. What about the data side, if, if the massive amounts of data? Clearly, when you got to move that stuff close to the computer, move the compute close to the data, it's, it's real stuff that's got to go. That's right, yeah. What, what's happening there that's going to enable you to, to apply this massive compute scale on similar kind of scales of the data? So I think there's going to be a lot of demand for bandwidth, no doubt, uh, over the next decade. Um, we, we see the data volumes going up faster than my cable connection to the internet is. Yes. So that's going to be a big factor. Um, we've been working on uh, a product called Dataman uh, that basically is a scheduler for data movement. So it's not a protocol, it's actually protocol agnostic, so it'll work with native Amazon APIs, it'll also work with things like rsync, and, and we're working on you know, grid FTP and, and other protocols for moving the data. But the timing and scheduling and workflow pieces are critically important, and we actually have a lot of interesting IP and a lot of interesting software in those areas. Um, you know, We did a 1.21 petaflop uh, computer with 150,000 core, um, we now have a 1.2 petabyte data scheduling, which is taking and in encrypting genomes and moving them into Glacier, uh, so they can be archived on an exceptionally cost-effective basis. Right. Um, and we think there's going to be a massive market around the workflow pieces because there are a lot of hard problems in that space and no good solutions. Right. Uh, no solutions, period. You're bumping into physics solutions. too, right? I mean, you, you're, exactly. moving, you're moving bits around. Well, and not only that, you have audit and reporting and which user needed which data transferred where at what time, and those kind of compliance and chargeback and reporting use cases, there's really not a good tool there. So data man's really kind of the only thing in that space that does a phenomenal job on all of those. And there are a lot of great tools for cloud connectivity. So there's various vendors that have appliances and other things that'll connect to cloud, but determining when, where, and how, and the workflow piece of putting the data into those environments is still a really untapped problem, and that's something we're aiming right at, because essentially a lot of the stuff we have to, to move data around, you know, in a 156,000 core environment, turns out to be really relevant in moving data off of a scientific instrument, onto the filer, over to a, a research environment that's running compute against it. Right. Those kinds of movement use cases and tracking all of that is actually critically important. So, that, so it's a, uh, the new area around um, uh, scheduling for us is going to be in the area of data scheduling, data transfer. Yeah, especially with the Internet of Things, that volume is only going to go up, right? Right, and tracking gonna requirements go are going to get that much bigger because what happens if you essentially drop a message or, or miss things about a live feed of telemetry data from cars or crops or what have you? I mean, there's a lot of very interesting audit use cases there yeah. that I think are going to be um, exciting over time. So what's next? What's the next uh, the next hill to climb? So we're looking the, forward to. The, uh, the next ones for us are going to be, again, talking about making it exceptionally easy to spin up an entire research environment with a push of a button with all the applications you need. You'll see some use cases coming out about us. We actually announced today that the scientific software, Schrodinger Material Science Group, uh, this is Matt Halls, he's a, a stellar researcher and, and basically runs Schrodinger Material Science from the product side. Um, we now can offer that to customers. So what we did in that 156,000 core use case is no longer an, a one-off. You can actually push a button and be able to get a very large cluster, that's and that's packaged. a commercial offering with them. So we do that uh, in concert with them. We're really excited about it. You'll see more and more of those kinds of packaging of different applications in, in different sciences and engineering and quantitative finance areas. The other thing that I think is going to be really exciting is, is the data movement stuff um, that, that you just touched on. I, I think basically being able to make it really easy to manage big data, not, not from a compute perspective and analysis, you know, tools like Hadoop and Cassandra and whatnot work really well, but what if I want to take my data out of Hadoop and run it directly into Glacier and archive it uniquely? Those kinds of use cases are uh, untapped mm -hmm. and things that I think we can do an excellent job of enabling. So that's, that's the other side of it. And then lastly, 
we're going to continue to do utility supercomputing every chance we get where we can talk about it. So we have some use cases that are tens of thousands of processors right now that we don't have customer permission to talk about. <laughs> but um, as we get larger and larger use cases in that space, we'll, we'll come to you guys and tell you about some really cool science and how somebody's changing the world in their area, but by utility access through the cloud. Awesome. It's uh, what an a AWS enables is, uh, is awesome, uh, especially when you put it together with our software. It's been very exciting. Mind bending, I think, even. Okay, Jason, thanks for coming back on theCUBE. Well, great to have you, great uh, insight. Uh, always great to sit down and extract the data out of your head and share it with the audience. Uh, folks, this is theCUBE, this is what we do. We go out to the events, extract the signal from noise. Jason Stowe, guru, CEO of so Slack, been doing amazing stuff with the cloud. Creativity is being unleashed, productivity, game changing disruption, and innovation. This is theCUBE. We're right back live in San Francisco for Amazon Web Summit, uh, Web Services uh, Summit after this short break.